what I want to say as we begin this weekend is you will never be sinless on this planet, but it is possible to sin less. You're never going to be sinless, but it is possible to sin less, and it is possible to deal with your defects. That's what we're going to look at at this weekend. And I, I want us to just look at a couple things. Why is it so hard to change the stuff in me that I really don't like about myself that I'd like to change? Why is that so hard? And then what does it take to change? And we're gonna look at the classic passage in the Bible on this, Ephesians chapter four, which gives us the six requirements for personal change. What it takes to change those deeply ingrained defects in your life that you don't like, you don't wanna carry on with you the rest of your life, you really would like to change them, what does it take to change those things? First, why is it so hard? Why is it so hard to change the stuff in me that I don't like? Well, there are four reasons. I put a little space there at the top of your outline. You could just write these in there. Four reasons why it's hard to change some of the defects in our, in our life. That's what we're talking about, the hard stuff that just seems to be stubborn and, and resistant. Number one, the first reason is because I've had them so long. I've had my defects so long, I'm actually pretty comfortable with them. Now, you didn't get the way you are overnight. I mean, it took a long time for you to get as messed up as you are. <laughs> it, it didn't happen overnight, it, it took years. And uh, some of the patterns that you have, your fears, your anxieties, your faults, and the way you react in self-defeating ways, uh, you know, you developed them in childhood, maybe in, res you know, in resistance or uh, to, a, to a pain or to, as a stress coping device, and, and maybe it was a survival tactic as a kid, but you're an adult and you still act that way. And you're not a kid anymore. Uh, but the, the truth is you've had these defects in your life for a long time, and they may be de self-defeating, but at least they're familiar. And you're comfortable with them, and you know what it is. Second reason that I have a hard time dealing with my defects is because I identify with them. I not only have had them for a lifetime, but I identify with them. And this is a real big problem because we often confuse our identity with our defects. You are not your defects. You are not your faults. You are not your sins. They may be something you do, but they're not your identity. In other words, a lot of people, rather than saying, I work too much, will say, I'm a workaholic. Or instead of saying, you know, I have a tendency to, to put off and procrastinate, they say, I'm lazy. You create it as an identity. And you may say, you know, I'm timid, or I'm shy, or I tend to just say what I want to think, or I, I'm aggressive, or I'm passive, or, or uh, I, I'm fearful. And, and you start identifying with your defects. You are not your defects. This, by the way, is the difference between Celebrate Recovery, which is Saddleback's biblical-based uh, recovery program, and something like, say, Alcoholics Anonymous. In Alcoholics Anonymous, a person will stand up and they will say, hi, I'm Joe, and I'm an alcoholic. In other words, they identify their identity with their defect. I'm Joe, and I'm an alcoholic. But it, in Celebrate Recovery, we will stand up and say, hi, I'm Joe, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ who struggles with alcohol. You see the difference? You are not your sin. You are not your defect. You see, a lot of people think because I have a certain tendency, a certain lust, a certain attraction, uh, a certain fault, a, a certain habit, then that is me, and they say, I am, and then name it. No, no, you're not your identity. Now, this is so important because when you see yourself connected to your defect, you set yourself up to perpetuate it. In other words, if you say, you know, I'm always nervous when I get on a plane. When you get on a plane, guess what's gonna happen? You're gonna be nervous. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And if you tell yourself, I'm always late, guess what? You're gonna always be late or I'm this, or I'm that, then you're gonna act in according to your identity. And, and then that keeps you from changing because unconsciously I think, you know, if this is me, then if I change, who am I? 
and all of a sudden your identity is kind of messed up because you have identified yourself with a particular way of acting, thinking, attracting, desiring, lusting, or whatever. It's hard to change because I've had my defects all my life. It's hard to change because I tend to identify with them. Number three, it's hard to change because my defects have a payoff. There is a reward to everything you do. People don't do things that aren't rewarded. And whatever is rewarded gets repeated. And if you're doing something that you know isn't good for you or it's self-destructive or it's ruining a relationship or messing up your marriage or it's destroying your finances or whatever, it's because there is some kind of payoff, an emotional payoff, a relational payoff, and maybe you don't see it but we don't do things that aren't rewarded. Anytime a negative behavior gets repeated over and over and over, maybe in a little kid, maybe in a grown adult, you see something being done over and over and over, maybe you say, I don't like to do this, but I do it anyway, you're still getting some kind of payoff. And part of what you've gotta figure out, the Bible tells, tells us to examine ourselves, figure out, what's the payoff? Why do I keep doing this? Because you don't do things without a payoff, maybe temporary. You know. Kids set their moms up to yell. I mean, a mom says, kids, come down to dinner. Nobody comes down to dinner. Kids, come down to dinner. You guys get down here right now. And the kids come down. They are training their mom to yell. Why? Because the, she learns the payoff is if I yell, I get action. Okay, now that's true in every area of life. Now, I don't know what the payoff is for the, the defects you have in your life. Maybe it's to mask your pain. Maybe it's to cover up a, few, a fear. Maybe it's to give you an excuse to fail. Maybe it's to compensate for guilt. Maybe it's to get back at somebody, a former spouse or a parent. I, I, I really don't know. It may be giving you attention, but there is a payoff to everything you do. And that's why it's hard to change even stuff we don't like about ourselves because we don't often know why we do it. Now there's a fourth reason why it's difficult to change these hard ingrained defects in our lives and that is because Satan discourages me. Satan discourages me. He wants you to stay stuck in your stuckness. And so he's constantly suggesting negative thoughts. As I've said to you many times, when uh, you know uh, God gives you an idea, we call that inspiration. When Satan gives you an idea, we call that temptation. When you get an idea, we call it stupidity. No, I'm just kidding. But the, the truth is, you get thoughts in your mind all your time. And Satan is constantly, once you start trying to work on something in your life that you wanna change, he starts saying, who do you think you are? You're never gonna change. You haven't been able to change in the past. You think you're gonna be able to change now? What do you think you're doing? You can't change, it's hopeless. It's not gonna work. And when it starts working, you say, it's not gonna work very long. And you may as well give up. And then sometimes Satan starts putting fears in your mind when you start trying to change some things or letting God change you. And he starts saying, you know, if you rock the boat, something really bad may happen. If you rock the boat in this relationship, they may walk out on you. If you rock the boat in this relationship, they may not love you anymore. If you rock the boat, nobody's gonna like you. Where do you think those fears are coming from? They're being planted in your mind. Now, these things keep us from wanting to change or keep us from changing the ingrained things that we know are not good for us, that are unhealthy. So what does it take to change those deep patterns in my life that I really don't like about me? It takes six things. There are six requirements. We're gonna look at them today from Ephesians chapter four. If you have a Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter four. If you don't, all of the verses are written out there uh, on your outline. Ephesians four, verses 21 to 27 says this. Since you have heard all about Jesus and you have learned the truth that is in him, throw off your old evil nature and your former way of life that's rotten through and through, full of lust and deception. In other words, we deceive ourselves. Instead, there's gotta be a new, a spiritual renewal of your thoughts and your attitudes. 
You must put on the new nature. She says, put off the old, put on the new. Put on the new nature because you're a new person created in God's likeness, righteous and holy and true. So put away all falsehood. That means stop faking it, stop posing, stop pretending you got it all together. Put away all falseness and tell your neighbor the truth because we belong, we belong to each other. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry for anger gives a mighty foothold to the devil. Now, in this passage, it talks about the six requirements for personal change. How do I change the defects in my life that I don't wanna carry with me for the next year, five years, 10 years, or the rest of my life? Well, the Bible tells us in this passage of Ephesians 4, there are six requirements. You gotta have all six of these in your life to make these changes. Number one, change requires learning the truth. That's the first requirement. Change requires learning the truth. Now, you know this famous quote of Jesus. Jesus said, when you know the truth, the truth will what? Set you free, yeah. And you're not gonna be free until you know the truth. Now, Paul starts in this very same thing in verse 21. He says, since you have heard all about Jesus and you have learned the truth, circle that, the truth that is in him. Now, if you don't get anything else I say today, get this. The secret to personal change is not a pill, it's not a program, it's not a process, it's not therapy, it's not a book, a seminar, it's not positive thinking or psychology or anything else. The proof, the, the, the proof of personal change is found in the truth. You've got to know and face the truth. You gotta know and face the truth about yourself before you can change. You've gotta know and face the truth about your relationships before you can change. You've gotta know and face the truth about your past before you can change. You've gotta know and face the truth about God before you can change. You've gotta know and face the truth about your habits, your hurts, your hangups. You've gotta know and face the truth about your potential and your talents. You've gotta know and face the truth about others, brothers, sisters, parents, everybody, all those kind of things. You've gotta know and face the truth about God's purpose for your life. Nothing changes until you start with the bedrock of truth. If you don't know the truth about these things, you are building on a phony, fake, false foundation. And it's gonna crumble when you hit the rogue winds of life. Every day, our faith is assaulted by the world's values, our sinful nature, and the forces of evil. But wielding God's word, you can find the wisdom to discern, the strength to endure, the grace to grow, and the power to fight and win this battle. That's why Pastor Rick created a very special scripture box filled with 52 graphically designed Bible verse cards that will help you win the spiritual battles you face every day by memorizing God's Word. This beautiful scripture box is silver with the look and feel of leather. This unique tool will help you put on the armor of God, remind yourself of God's promises, and replace lies with God's eternal truth. When you give a gift to help Daily Hope take the certain hope of Jesus to people everywhere, we'll send you the silver scripture box to say thanks. Now, why is it so important to learn the truth for anything I wanna change in life? I'll tell you why. Because behind every self-defeating behavior in my life is a lie I'm believing. Behind every self-defeating behavior in my life is a lie I'm believing. If you're deeply in debt right now, it's because you believed some lies. You thought, you know, I can just keep charging it forever and I won't and I can get away with it. Oh, really? The entire world governments now know that delayed gratification doesn't work. And maybe you thought, I have to have this house. Oh, really? Do you really have to have this? Is it true? Can you prove it's true? How do you know it's true? 
Every time you get yourself into problem, it's because you have believed some lie. Like, I have to do this in order to get ahead. I have to do this in order to be liked. I have to do this in order to be happy. Oh, really? We lie to ourselves all the time. We have an amazing ability. The biggest liar in your life is you to you, okay? Because you tell yourself all the time it's no problem when it really is a problem, and you tell yourself it's not a problem, and you tell yourself it is a problem and sometimes it's not. What is it in your life you're pretending isn't a problem, the big elephant in the living room? You gotta deal with the truth. I have to know and face the truth, first of all, if I'm gonna change. Now, Jesus said the truth will set you free, but first, it makes you miserable. And it makes you miserable as long as you deny it. Now, the moment you are honest with the truth about you and everything else in life, then it starts setting you free. Now, who is the truth? Jesus said, I am the truth. Not I have it, not I point the way, not I teach it. He said, I'm it, I am the truth. So you can trust his word, and his word is the Bible. The Bible is good for four things. The Bible tells us what it was given for, why God gave us. Look at this next verse, 2 Timothy chapter three. All scripture is inspired by God, and it's useful, and it tells us for four things. Number one, to teach us what is true. You gotta build it on truth. To make, number two, make us realize what's wrong in our lives. Number three, it straightens us out, and number four, it teaches us to do what is right. It's God's way of preparing us in every way, fully equipped for every good thing God wants us to do. God's word does four things. It shows you the path to live on. If you stay on that path, you're gonna have a pretty good life. It shows us when we get off the path, you messed up, that's called reproof. It shows us how to get back on the path, that's called correction. It shows us how to stay on the path, that's called instruction or training in righteousness. So change requires learning the truth. Number two, the next verse tells us the second requirement for personal change, and it's this. Change requires making choices. Change requires making choices, and they've gotta be good choices, obviously, but what I'm saying here is that it's not enough just to want to change. It's not enough to just desire to change. It's not even enough to just say, I've got a dream of changing. I've got a dream of being something else. Dreams are worthless unless you wake up and actually act on them. So more than desire, more than dreaming, it takes a decision. You're not gonna change until you choose to change. A lot of people think about changing, they plan on changing, they want to change, they say someday I'll change, or when I get around to it, I'll change, but they don't ever actually choose to change. You see, it's not going to happen without intention. Let me put it this way. How are you gonna be different in six months? Are you gonna be emotionally stronger? Are you gonna be mentally sharper? Are you gonna be physically healthier? Are you gonna be spiritually deeper? The answer is no, unless you choose to be that way. God's waiting on you. And it'll happen when you get intentional. Now, why don't we make these choices? Because internally, we don't think this way, but it's, we know it in, instinctively. There is no growth in your life without change. And there is no change without loss. You gotta let go of some old stuff. And there, there is no loss without pain. Look at this next verse, verse 22. He says, throw off, that means get rid of, let go, throw off your old evil nature and your former way of life, all those bad habits and patterns and the defects, which is rotten through and through, full of lust and deception. All that stuff where you've been telling yourself it's okay, but it's not okay, because it's really messing up your life. He says, throw off that old nature. Now, we, we spent an entire message on this last week, talking about your old nature. If you missed that message, you need to go back and listen to all three in this series that we've built on so far. Each of your parents gave you 23,000 chromosomes. And because your parents were imperfect, they gave you some of their imperfections. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed the older you get, the more like your parents you get? Okay? And, and so, and since we all came back from originally from Adam and Eve, then what's gonna happen? It means from Adam and Eve, there has been a sinful tendency, a old nature that in all of us, that we want to do what we're not supposed to do. 
And growing up, you're told, now don't touch that stove, it's hot, and what do you do? It's like you see a sign that says, wet paint, don't touch. What do you wanna do? You know? And it's like, when I was growing up, my mom would always say, now, Ricky, I don't wanna hear a peep out of you. Every bone in my body wanted to go, peep. <laughs> okay, why? That's the old nature, the tendency to say, nobody's gonna tell me what to do. I'm my own boss, I'm my own God. And, and, and so we have, part of the, the, the defects come from you for three, part of your defects are biological, some of them are sociological, and some of them are theological. Some of them are nature and some of them are nurture, but some of them come from circumstances, some of them come from choices, and some of them come from your chromosomes. Doesn't really matter where they come from, you need to deal with it, okay? I want you to write this down. Genetics explain my, my, my inclinations. Genetics explain my inclinations, but they don't excuse my sins. Genetics explain my inclinations, but they don't excuse my sins. Just because I have a natural inclination towards something doesn't mean I should do it and doesn't mean it's necessarily good. I can have all kinds of self-destructive inclinations. In fact, we all have those in our lives. For instance, I might be born with a natural inclination to get, get angry. Some people, it's real obvious, have a harder time with anger than others. They're just born that way. They come out of the womb chomping on a cigar, saying, I dare you, you know, okay? And, and, and some people are just predisposed to get angry. Other people aren't. You have fears and you got other problems. But, but let's say I've got a natural inclination to get angry. That doesn't excuse me to just go abuse everybody, verbally or physically. There's no excuse for that. Some people are born naturally motivated and they're ready to take on the world from day one and other people aren't born with a lot of motivation. And it's kind of like, let it happen. And I may be born with a natural inclination to not really do a whole lot but that does not excuse me to do nothing with my life and just be lazy. I may be born with a predisposition or a natural inclination to be addicted to things. I might have an addictive personality and I, I tend to get addicted to television or food or drugs or alcohol or sex or pornography. Or I might have a natural inclination, an addictive personality, some people do, but that does not excuse me to go act it out just because I have a tendency or a desire or an attraction or an affinity or a predisposition does not mean that I should act on it. Now, it, genetics explains my inclination. It does not excuse my acting out or my sense. Now, here's the good news, and we talked about it last week. Once you become a believer, you have a new power in you that is greater than those old tendencies, and that power is the Holy Spirit. You see, in changing the defects in your life, God has a part and you have a part. It's not all God and it's not all you. It's kind of like growing up physically. Growing up physically, there are some things you could do that would help you grow, like eat right, sleep right, exercise, but there are some things that are totally out of your control. No matter how much you eat, sleep, and exercise, you didn't get to choose how tall you're gonna be. God chose that you didn't choose your bone structure. And, and so part of your physical growth was God's responsibility, and part of your uh, physical growth was your responsibility. The same is true with your spiritual growth. God has a part, and you have a part in your spiritual growth. Now notice this next verse, this explains it. Philippians chapter two. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Now I want you to circle the phrases, work out and work in. This is the balance. There's a working out and there's a working in when there, you wanna make changes in your life. The working out is your part and the working in is God's part. Now I wanna explain this verse in detail because I don't want you to misunderstand it. Continue to work out your salvation. Notice it doesn't say, continue to work for your salvation. It says work out 
not for. Nowhere in the Bible are you told to work for your salvation. You cannot earn your way to heaven. You cannot buy your way into heaven. You cannot deserve your way into heaven. It is a gift. And the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace, God's gift, we are saved through faith. And even that is not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so nobody can brag about it. In other words, you cannot work your way to heaven. You cannot earn your way to heaven. The Bible says over and over, it is a free gift. Every day, our faith is assaulted by the world's values, our sinful nature, and the forces of evil. But wielding God's Word, you can find the wisdom to discern, the strength to endure, the grace to grow, and the power to fight and win this battle. That's why Pastor Rick created a very special scripture box filled with 52 graphically designed Bible verse cards that will help you win the spiritual battles you face every day by memorizing God's Word. This beautiful scripture box is silver with the look and feel of leather. This unique tool will help you put on the armor of God, remind yourself of God's promises, and replace lies with God's eternal truth. When you give a gift to help Daily Hope take the certain hope of Jesus to people everywhere, we'll send you the silver scripture box to say thanks. 